How many forms of wealth in 2024 does the average person have? I would say we all have a number of the forms of wealth. I think a truly beautiful life is, you know, in hot pursuit of each of the forms of wealth, whether it's wellness, whether it's adventure, whether it's seeing your work as a chance for mastery, doing what the world says you should do to become successful. It makes me think of Jim Carrey, the Hollywood legend. And he said, I wish everyone could be rich and famous to realize it doesn't make a difference. Do you feel like we have a hard time living in the present as well? Is that another side effect of the reality that we live in? Because everything you just mentioned, and I would assume a lot of the issues with our self-awareness come from always fear-based, always thinking about the potential future that hasn't happened yet. I really do think a lot of us have fallen into a series of traps. We are addicted to our phones. We are addicted to being busy, addicted to endless notifications. We are addicted to comparing our lives with what we see on screens. And we are addicted, I really believe, to this of thinking that wealth is only about money and material possessions and fame and fortune. Welcome to Success Story. I'm your host, Scott Clary. The Success Story podcast is part of the HubSpot Podcast Network. HubSpot is a huge supporter of the show. I'm a huge fan of HubSpot, not just because they support the show, because they support entrepreneurs. And if you are an entrepreneur, you have some problems that a lot of entrepreneurs have. Productivity, and it's not a secret. It's nothing to be ashamed of. You're not the only one that has this problem. And why do we have this problem? Well, all the tools and the tech that we're using, they're massively overcomplicated. We have tons of time-consuming tasks. Our teams are not getting the information they need to close the deals, connect with customers, whatever it is. As entrepreneurs and our teams, we all have productivity problems, but HubSpot's customer platform truly helps. It was built to save time and make your job easier so you can get back to building your business. No more hours wasted on time-consuming tasks. No more chasing down prospect info if you're trying to close someone. No more one system for this, another system for that. HubSpot can help you find leads, reach prospects, deliver the insights you need to convert them to customers all in one place. Plus, HubSpot AI can literally do more work for you so you can focus more on scaling your business because HubSpot knows you have massive growth goals and they're here to make your productivity problem go away. Visit HubSpot.com to learn how they can help you grow better. Robin, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate you taking the time. I appreciate the invitation. Great to be with you, Scott. Well, it's my pleasure. I think I think that to start this off, I want to just paint a picture for everybody who's listening or watching. So you discuss eight forms of wealth. How many forms of wealth in 2024 does the average person have? Well, what a great question. I've never been asked that. I would say we we all have a number of the forms of wealth. I think a truly beautiful life is when we're, you know, in hot pursuit of each of the eight forms of wealth, whether it's wellness, whether it's adventure, whether it's seeing your work as a chance for mastery, uh, whether it's service, one of the most important forms of wealth. So I think all of us have a lot of it, but I wrote The Wealth Money Can't Buy because society has given us this cultural hypnosis that we are wealthy when we have a lot of money. We are wealthy when we have a big house. We are wealthy when we have a huge stock portfolio. And uh, I've mentored a lot of billionaires over the past 15 plus years. And I can report with respect that a lot of them are cash rich, but life poor. Do you find that there was a certain point, not even in the people that you've mentored, like I think that if you're talking about billionaire, they're they're very far along in their career. But when you look at, you know, the lessons that you've written about and you look back even in your life, was there a certain point in your life when there was a light bulb moment? Because you, you moved away from law at a relatively young age and you started writing and coaching and teaching. Uh, Was that? sort of the light bulb moment that even a career in law that could have paid significant amount of money, that was not the form of wealth that you wanted to pursue? Well, it was that, and it was also just being in the world and doing what the world says you should do to become successful. Uh, Makes me think of, I'm here in Los Angeles, so I think of Jim Carrey, the, the Hollywood legend, and he said, I wish everyone could be rich and famous to realize it doesn't make a difference. 
And so I was on that hamster wheel as a lawyer, and I had bought into the cultural programming of you know, get more shiny toys, et cetera, et cetera. And one day you wake up happy, and that's success. And when I got a better car or nicer house or made more financial resources, it didn't change how I felt. It makes me think of the Zen proverb, wherever you go, there you are. Wherever you go, there you are. So we fall into this trap thinking, okay, if I could only reach this personal Mount Everest of more FFA, fame, fortune, and applause, I would wake up and I'd feel fantastic and we miss out on JPF, joy, peace, and freedom. Now, I want to be really clear, Scott, this model that the book is based around, the eight forms of wealth, money is one of the eight forms of wealth. So I'm not saying making money is not important. It puts food on the family table. It allows us freedom. We don't get backed into a corner and have to do things we don't want to do. Money allows us to do great things for our loved ones. It's just one of the eight forms of wealth. There are seven other essential forms that I believe a great human life is worth uh, uh, building around. So if you look at those, let's let's list them out. This will paint the picture for all the discussions. So we have, we have yes money, which is what everybody feels is is what they're pursuing. I think a lot of us feel we're pursuing that. We have growth, wellness, family, craft, community, adventure, and service. And I think these are very interesting. And obviously, I would even love, just very briefly, before we go down the rabbit hole a little bit farther, like in your own words, what do, what do these different forms of wealth mean? And yeah, let's start there so people can frame it. Okay, so all your viewers from around the world, that's what the model looks like. Quickly, the first form of wealth growth. If someone is in hot pursuit of becoming their best self, someone is working each day quietly, steadily through meditation, visualization, prayer, reading, journaling to become more powerful, stronger, braver, more authentic, more loving. If someone is in growth mode each day, like so many of your viewers are, that's a form of riches. The psychic wealth that comes to us from becoming more of ourselves is powerful. Second form of wealth, wellness. Someone once said to me, help is the crown on the well person's head that only the ill person can see. We have good health, good energy, longevity. We had wealth money can't buy. Three, family. What's the point of living in a mansion? Being there all alone. I tell a story in the book about one of my clients. Beautiful home, biggest I've ever seen. Art collection, car collection. No one to share his life with. Fourth form of wealth, craft. Whether you are a coder, a writer, a yoga teacher, a billionaire, street sweeper, doing your work like Picasso painted gives great joy and happiness. This form of wealth, money. And there's actually 20 chapters on how the billionaires do it from my intimate knowledge of their mindsets, habits, ways of being. Sixth form of wealth is community. You become your conversations. So it's all about stripping out the energy vampires and the importance and how to find people whose lives you want to be living. Seventh form of wealth, adventure. A lot of us are living the same year 80 times and calling it a life. <laughs> so like, like there's 25 chapters in that section on how to inject awe and wonder, which is a form of wealth. You go, wow, my life is amazing. It's magic. That's a form of wealth. And then the final one is service. And before I came on to your podcast, I reread Mahatma Gandhi's beautiful line and he said, to lose yourself in the service of others is how you really find yourself. So we have we have these these eight versions of wealth, and I think that people probably again to the first point they've participated in some, probably some are lacking. Um, but societal pressure is very strong; it's exceptionally strong. We didn't just accidentally stumble into just pursuing money. This is to keep up with the Joneses. Cost of living is exceptionally high, so. How do we, how do we sort of recalibrate? Is this, 
uh, sort of a commentary on you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and maybe we think we need more than we actually do to fulfill that, and we should be pursuing self actualization versus just putting a roof over our head, but our roof now costs three, four, five million dollars, uh, you know, whatever that is. So how do we reframe? How do we reprogram? And this is something that obviously you teach and you probably help people at any level. So there's not like uh, just when you're starting out, you're talking about billionaires that need reprogramming. So what is the, what's the playbook? The first step? The first step is an idea. As I do this podcast tour, Scott, everyone's going, what are the tactics? What are the tactics? Give me the tactics. <laughs> Methodology without philosophy is an empty victory. So ideas are important. We become so enamored with tactics and morning routines. I teach them in the book, tactics. There's hundreds of tools. Morning well, you're, routine. Kind of no, you're kind of known for <laughs> some morning routine <laughs> literature. Guilty as charged. So- but how do we start the process of seeing our programming? We start with the idea of, oh, maybe there are forms of wealth beyond money. And with these ideas and then thoughtfulness and paying attention and then asking ourselves, wow, am I really experiencing all eight forms of wealth? Transformation lives in awareness. As we build more awareness of how we're living, oh, I'm in, I'm, I'm caught up in the cultural hypnosis of chasing money and these mountaintops that in the end won't lead to anything. And then secondly, how do you start? There's a chapter in the book called Know the Penum Principle. Penum that deconstructs how we think the way we think. It's an acronym. P, our parents. E, our environment. N, our nation, A, our associations, and M, our media. And those five forces of Penham create cues. I mean, for example, with our parents, when we're growing up, our parents, we watch them. They teach us how the world works. They give us all these subtle cues. Here's what success looks like, Scott. And now we're 35 or 55 or 75, and we're still running those ancient programs, even though they're not right for us. So awareness is how we start We start thinking about these things. And then tools, MVP, meditation, visualization, and prayer is just a fantastic tool to rewire the programming. Journaling, this morning I was out writing in my, my journal, mm -hmm. you know, and so just journaling about what success looks like to you, what is wealth to you, what do you want to stand for, what are your top five values, those kinds of things. It starts the rewiring process. Final thing I'd say is your social circle. You're around people who are measuring success solely by financial wealth, then you're going to think like them through the power of emotional contagion. So creating social circle of people who go, oh, Money is one form of wealth, but so is family, so is wellness, so is adventure, so is service, et cetera. And I think that that's something that you have to actively potentially edit, not because the people are bad people, but because you want to know the direction that you want to move in. And that's the people that you have to keep close to you. I mean, the, 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 the tropes are all there, right? The, 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 the quotes of you are the five people that you surround, you surround yourself with. I think people have heard those a thousand times, but it's very, very accurate. So I think that maybe editing that circle is is more important than we realize because I think when we think about surrounding ourselves with individuals, the first thought is how do I surround myself with individuals that move the needle in my career or in my company or how do I add an extra comma in my bank account? But I also want to flip the script a little bit and bring up another habit that I've seen when people pursue other forms of wealth to a significant degree if they pursue community or religion or physical health and wellness, I feel that people always want to be hyper competitive and they always want to seem, they seem to want to win in these arenas. So you all know that friend that started working out and all of a sudden they become a little bit preachy about working out and not drinking and about eating right. So when we pursue, why do we do that? Why do we always feel the need to compete? Because I think that there's one toxic behavior, which is pursuing money exclusively. But then the second toxic behavior is always feeling that we have to beat someone if we take something else and assume it as part of our identity, which I think defeats the purpose of balance. Well, you say why. 
and I go back to that chapter in The Wealth Money Can't Buy Under Growth, the Penham Principle, right? Penham, parents, environment, nation, associations, and media. We are programmed to compete. We are programmed to see victory as reaching the top of the mountaintop that others are climbing. It's even neurobiological. Back on the savanna a thousand years ago, we were competing for the resources, competing for shelter, competing for to be dominant in the tribe. So I think as human beings, we are hardwired to compete in some ways. But I would actually suggest that's the reptilian brain, the lower way of thinking in survival mode. As we start to grow, as we evolve, as we think, as we meditate, as we journal, as we think about, you know, how we want to live, we realize there's a higher way to live. And that is running a race against yourself. So not competing. I think competing in many ways comes from scarcity. There's not enough. I must take it all. I think a much wiser, healthier way to roll through life, let's say, as an entrepreneur, is you run your own race. And basically, there's a fifth form of wealth and the wealth money can't buy is craft. And one of the chapters is I talk about your Project X. Your Project X is your Taj Mahal. Your Project X is your Sistine Chapel ceiling. Your Project X is your Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. In a world where we, so many of us are pushing out so much content, what I'm suggesting in this book is, in this chapter, is you do one thing. It might take you four years. It might take you 10 years. But you push that one masterwork out in the world that stands the test of time. You don't worry about competition. You don't look at what other people are doing. You just do what your instinct tells you you want to do. And I think if you, you know, worrying about competition is exhausting. And I do think it's coming yeah. from a place of, right? I do think it's coming from a place of fear. You kind of put on blinders and you say, here's the product I want to push out into the world. Here's my Sistine Chapel ceiling. And you push that magic out into the world. Amazing things will happen. Yeah, it's very powerful. It's it's almost a, like we we lack self reflection and and self awareness to a degree, which I think creates all of these negative habits that we're trying to avoid. Because if we had self reflection in what we were pursuing, or if we had self reflection in what we were looking to achieve, or I've heard you mention this before, are we climbing the right mountain? Or are we climbing the right Everest? And we looked inside, then maybe we realize that we're not. And yeah, I, I was even watching the trailer for uh, uh, for uh, for the wealth money uh, can't buy, and the trailer is you know grandpa's on his you know last breath, about to die, and I think he's talking to his grandkids, and it's such a powerful image because it happens to all of us, and death and our mortality, not to get too dark, but it's like a very powerful motivator to focus on what actually matters. I think actually one of my favorite things to do is to go to the last part of the book and in the last part of your book you're speaking about having a living funeral so it just forces us to to reevaluate what's so important and i think that not many people do that i think that many people are just waking up autopilot every single day yeah there's also another chapter at the end the final form of wealth which is service put your final day first and I actually would say thinking about your mortality is not a dark thing. It's a light thing. I would actually say that fluency with the shortness of life is how the warriors play. If you could regularly think about the shortness of life and remind yourself that soon or late, we will all be dust on a mantled above a fireplace next to our family little league trophies we're going to realize we're going to, we're going to realize we're going to live to the point to the point you know look scott accidents pandemics wars illness disease emergency that's the stuff of life these days in the age of polycrisis and so what i'm trying to do with the wealth money can't buy is say here are the things that let's call it the the eight Mount Everest to climb so that we don't, as you as you suggested, spend our best hours climbing the wrong mountains. 
because I really do think a lot of us have fallen into a series of traps. We are addicted to our phones. We are addicted to being busy, being busy. We are addicted to endless notifications. We are addicted to comparing our lives with what we see on screens. We are, and we are addicted, I really believe, to this quest of thinking that wealth is only about money and material possessions and fame and fortune. And you look at, like I say, I work with 15 plus years, so many billionaires, so many famous CEOs, so many sports superstars and entertainment icons. And so many of them have a lot of money, but that's all they have. Is that the biggest regret that they haven't invested in? Is Because I see a couple of thoughts on that. Because if they just have, if they just have money, so maybe they focus on family because they don't have a good relationship with their family. I see that quite often. They've, they've probably figured out craft. I would assume to a degree if they've figured out money. I don't know if those two things are intrinsically connected, but may, they seem to be, but you're the, you're the expert. But then the other things potentially are a little bit harder to put a finger on. So adventure, service, community, Okay, I want to understand that as well. So growth, adventure, service. Because I can put a finger on wellness, family, craft, and money. To me, that makes a lot of sense. And I can touch them and feel them. But how do I measure growth? How do I measure adventure? That to me is so ambiguous. I wouldn't even know how to start if I measure an adventure. Like every day is an adventure when I'm trying to build a company, but I don't think that's actually what you mean. So how do I measure some of these intangibles? Well, I love your point about what do the financial tycoons that I advise, what do they struggle with most? Yeah. And I've just written before the first come to mind family. There was one billionaire that I was advising, had all the money in the world, private jets, yachts, et cetera, et cetera. And he confided in me that he drinks too much and he's never happy because his 20 year old kids won't even talk to him and i and i hear that a lot people who have all the money in the world but they've sacrificed family so i think that's one thing they struggle with secondly health i've worked with a lot of uh, entrepreneurs super successful they've sold their companies they've made financial fortunes and they've lost their health along the way there's one wisdom tradition that says when we are young, we would sacrifice all of our health for wealth. When we get old and figure out what life is all about, we would sacrifice all of our wealth for one day of health. Health is one of those things, if we lose it, nothing else matters but getting our health back. So a lot of the billionaires that I work with, they struggle with health issues. They don't have energy. They, they've picked up all sorts of chronic issues because they devoted, they went all into the business. Third thing I've written down, this might surprise you, but a lot of them do suffer from imposter syndrome. And they say, the world sees me as so incredibly successful. I don't really know if I deserve it. And I don't really think I'm that smart. And I, and here's the thing, the seventh, the eighth form of wealth, they say, I want to have more of an impact. They've made the money and they go, I just want to have more of an impact on the world. I don't know my purpose. And then the final thing is you you identified it, Scott, which is they say, you know what? All I do is work. I need some adventure. An adventure in the book is not just going to Bali or going to Vietnam or going to explore Colombia or eating it. Adventure can be found in the small magic of daily graces. I live on a, a farm in Italy on an olive grove. And part of my magic every day is I've got this little five pound short key. I talk her a lot about her in the book. I call her super chum. And we just like walk this old dusty path on an olive grove each morning before I start my creative work. And just like walking with this little dog and seeing the fog coming up over the Tuscan Hills, looking at the sun, hearing the rooster growing too loudly, listening to the dogs barking, smelling the air. We could be present. That's a form of adventure. And you train yourself to build more awe and wonder. Sonia Lubomirsky is a positive psychologist. She said, 
happiest people have a habit. It's called savoring. Savoring. Savor the walk. Savor the adventures in each day. Savor a conversation with someone who maybe you've never talked to before. I just want to take a second and thank the HubSpot Podcast Network for supporting Success Story. We're part of the network. If you love podcasts, the HubSpot Podcast Network has other incredible podcasts like Entrepreneurs on Fire, hosted by John Lee Dumas. Entrepreneurs on Fire is one of the OG entrepreneur podcasts. It really stokes inspiration, shares strategies to fire up your entrepreneurial journey to create the life you've always dreamed of. It has unlimited energy, value, and consistency. The podcast is truly for anyone who wants to learn more about entrepreneurship. If you like fast-paced, packed with value stories, this show is for you. John brings on great guests. He speaks about failures, aha moments, what's working for them currently. If you love podcasts, go listen to Entrepreneurs on Fire wherever you get your podcasts. Do you feel like we have a, a hard time living in the present as well? Is that another side effect of of the reality that we live in? Because everything you just mentioned, and I would assume a lot of the issues with our self-awareness come from always fear-based, always thinking about the potential future that hasn't happened yet. Yeah, I, I say in the book, the past is not a prison to be lived in, but a school to be learned from. And I think a lot of us are not present. We're in the past. We can go, we can go down the rabbit hole and talk about micro trauma and macro trauma and why we shut down to the present moment why we close ourselves basically because we're scared of the world because of all the trauma micro or macro that we've gone through or we're living in the future but we're not living in the present moment and part of that as well as a lot of us don't like ourselves very much mm. Poten potential unexpressed turns to pain when we were little kids we the world was our oyster we had a sparkle in our eye we wanted to be astronauts. We wanted to be podcasters like you. We wanted to be teachers and heroes. And then through the five forces of Penham that I talk about in the book, you're getting hurt, disappointed, being programmed, be average, be ordinary. We start to close. We start to forget who we truly are. We stop dreaming. We start to become like the herd. And so... The higher part of ourselves, I think we have a heroic self, which is just our wisdom, our natural state, and we have an egoic self, and that's the fearful part of us that evolves as we go through life. We forget our heroic selves. We forget who we truly are. We start to close, and the heroic self, the wisdom, or call it a conscience, doesn't like who we're becoming because it sees we're committing the crime of self-betrayal. And so potential unexpressed turns to pain. We start to develop all this subconscious latent pain, and we don't really like ourselves. What am I trying to say here? I'm trying to say that we then try to escape ourselves through too much phone use, through much, too much busyness and overwork, too much alcohol or drugs or whatever the drug of choice is. And so that's why we can't become present. And we, come, we end up alone in a room, and we've got to pull out our phone. Got to turn on the TV. But if you don't love yourself, how can you love your work? How can you love the world? How can you push magic into the marketplace? That's a scary ass thought for people to come to terms with that they don't love themselves because that is, that is a realization that the, the, the culmination of all the things that you've done over your life has not led to the best version of who you want to be. And I mean, that's very scary. Well, even there, there's the fifth, excuse me, the fourth form of wealth is craft. So there's about 20 chapters in the Wealth Money Can't Buy on how the masters do it. I, sp I spent a year of my life on this book. I spent four years of my life writing 5 a.m. club. But this book, I rewrote maybe 20 times. And each rewrite maybe had 10,000 rewrites on it. I could have mailed it in. My publisher would have been happy. So why would I have put my heart and soul in this book and suffered as much as I did? Because doing your best work is suffering. 
It's a beautiful suffering. You feel incredibly satisfied afterwards. But I suffered. I was up at 3 a.m. some mornings trying to make deadlines, timelines. It's in large part because I love my consumers. I have a sacred bond with the people who put food on my family table. This is year number 31. I've been in this field of writing books on leadership and personal mastery. And I have a sacred bond with the people who read my books. So I love them. So we don't talk about love as a business tool, but unless you, de you could talk it, you could host it, but uh, unless in your quiet moments you feel a love for the people who you serve, you're never going to do your best work. But once you love them, you want to do good by them, you care about them, you will run to the ends of the earth to do your best work for them because of that trust bond. But the relationship with your customers or your family or your friends or your neighbors, it all comes down to the relationship with yourself, the primary relationship. And once you and that's why the first section of the book is all about growth. Once you work on what I call mindset, heart set, health set, and soul set and become more of who you're meant to be, that relationship then lifts up everything on the outside with it. I love that. Um, you have some, you have, by the way, how you've written this book, I actually really like because you've, there's, I don't even know how many, like over hundreds, uh, like a hundred, 200 different ideas that are all very concise, condensed, clear, and very impactful. So it's a fun read, by the way. But outside of that, there are a few ideas that I really want to focus on. I mean, there's some ideas around the 10,000 dinner questions, uh, take a bath in a forest, uh, be a perfect moment maker, the lost letters rule. These are some really prolific ideas that you spend a lot of time on. Before I go into a couple of these and we sort of speak about them, why are these ideas, these particular ones, out of all the different ideas that you presented in the book, the ones that you feel you really want to communicate? Well, I want to communicate all of the ideas in the book. The, the ones I you do. mentioned. I know. I, I think I, they I jumped out that. to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think they jumped out to you, Scott. <laughs> um, and I say that with a lot of respect. I, I, uh, But you've highlighted some of the ones that are jumping out to a lot of the early readers of The Wealth Money Can't Buy. So let's focus on the 10,000 dinners question. That is the third form of wealth family. Yeah. So in uh, the Financial Times, they did an interview with Ayesha Bardag, one of the UK's top divorce lawyers. She represents the footballers and the movie stars, et cetera. And she was asked, well, you've seen so many marriages fall apart. What's, what are the secrets for a great it's great unions. And Scott, she said, number one, separate bedrooms. And number two, she said, 10,000 dinners. So the chapter in the book called Ask the 10,000 Dinners Question, it's, it's, a, it's a decision matrix before you pick a life partner or go into a deep relationship. Ask yourself. Can I have 10,000? Do I see myself enjoying 10,000 dinners with this person? Because as Aisha said in the interview, looks fade, lust fades, but friendship doesn't. So that's the 10,000 dinners question. Then you asked about taking a bath in the forest. That's the second form of wealth, which is wellness, about 20 chapters on that. We're getting into a lot of the latest science on longevity because the key to legendary is longevity. You want to be around a long, long time. And it's based on the Japanese habit of forest bathing. Shinrin Roku, I believe I said that correctly. But it's forest bathing. They actually have parks and forests across Japan because they understand when you go out into the woods, there's the creation of a pharmacy of mastery within our brains and amazing things happen through our wellness. Inflammation goes down. We breathe fresh air. So I say, take a bath in a forest on a daily basis. Get out to the woods. 
We live in a world where there's so much noise, we don't hear the signal. And then you mentioned be a perfect moment creator. Long story short, the former CEO of KPMG, the accounting giant, went into his doctor's office and his doctor came out with a face that you never want to see on your doctor's face when you go in for a, for a routine medical checkup. His doctor said, you've got 90 days left to live. You have an inoperable brain tumor. And Eugene Kelly realized in all those years, he had been building his company. He hadn't even taken his wife out to lunch once. He missed so many concerts of his daughter. He didn't go on long walks with his friends. So he made a, I felt this was very powerful. He made a decision. He said, in the last 90 days of my life, I want to reverse engineer it to create perfect moments. And so in the chapter, I talked about the power of being a perfect moment creator. You know, and again, that awareness, oh, what can I do each day or every once a week to create perfect moments with my family, with my friends? Well, then you start taking the mundane and make it a little magical. The last one that I really liked as well, which is actually very relevant to me, is find your personal golden eye, which that's all about distraction and, and shiny object syndrome. Um, Let's speak about that as well. What does that mean to to readers or to entrepreneurs? Genius loves solitude. I better say that again because it's so important. Genius loves solitude. Another way I could put it is you can be in the world or you could play with your phone or dominate your domain. You can't do both. And so that chapter on find your personal golden eye comes from my reading of James Bond creator, Ian Fleming. And what he did was what all geniuses do. He found a creative cottage. He invested, and I used the word investment, for all your entrepreneurial followers who want success, your viewers, I would say one of the best investments you could ever make is finding a creative cottage. Even if it's a public library on the third floor back in the stacks, but you need to find a place you can retreat to where the world can get you. And so what Ian Fleming did was he bought this place in Jamaica. He called it Golden Eye. Mm -hmm. And it was on the sea and he would go there and he wrote his James Bond books. And that's how you institutionalize flow stuff. He was actually so obsessed with avoiding distraction, he would tell he instructed his gardeners. Do not walk across the med the lawn while I'm writing because I'll be in flow state and you'll break the trance. When you when you move out to Italy, that's basically your that's basically your that's your that's your golden eye right there. When you go to Italy, when you go for walks, when you work until three in the morning, that is your golden eye. My writing room at the old farmhouse I live in is my golden yeah. eye. No one can get me there. And I actually have something called the two phone protocol. I have the phone that I am, your, your viewers might like this. I'm just going to reach over if I could. Yeah, yeah, um, for sure. But, so I'm on, the, I'm on the phone that we're doing this with, but I have a second phone. And it's, so this is called a two phone protocol. So when I'm in my golden eye, whether it is the writing room at the farmhouse, but I love, I love renting hotel rooms, even in my own city. I need to get a creative work project done. I will rent a hotel room for a week. I'll put it on Do Not Disturb. I'll nap when I'm tired. I'll order food when I need to. And I just get monomaniacally focused on doing the work. So there's no distraction. The two phone protocol. So I'm we're recording this podcast on my main phone, but this is my second phone that I carry with me in creative mode. And on this phone, it's a Spartan phone. There's no social media whatsoever. It's just emergencies, and I can do research if I need to. So the two two phone protocol is another way to isolate yourself. So when you're working, you do real work versus fake work. And the section in the Wealth Money Camp Buy on Craft talks a lot about how you get real work done so you push mastery into the marketplace. So if you look at all of these different lessons and teachings, I'm actually curious in your life, what have you struggled with the most? Well, 
one thing it's a it's a phrase I teach which is cheer, cheerful paranoia and what I'm trying to say and I want to get it very clear but as you have more impact it's essential you think more like a beginner mm -hmm. and I've been in the field for a long time it would very be very easy for me to mail it in versus bring it on and so there's a term I teach to my clients called cheerful paranoia, and it comes from Andy Grove, the co-founder of Intel, who said only the paranoid survive. Now, paranoia is not healthy, so I'm saying be cheerfully paranoid. And what I mean by that is never take your success for granted. What I also mean is as we rise in success, we must become work harder, innovate more, take more risks because success is very vulnerable. So one thing I call it a struggle is this this latest book, for example, I, I pushed myself like I have with no other book because I just don't want to rest on my laurels. I want to do good by my readers. I want to explore unknown dimensions of my craft. When you think about somebody who reads this book and they want to start, they just want to start to move in the right direction and they, and they, you know, they bought into the concept of, yeah, I'm, you know, when I'm too laser focused on one particular area of my life, um, I would assume it could be overwhelming to start to try and incorporate eight versions of wealth <laughs> tomorrow. So I know that you said you don't like playbooks too much because you have to plant the idea first, but for somebody who needs to start something, I need them to move in the right direction, even slightly move in the right direction. And I don't want it to be a January 1st, join a gym and then quit in 30 days moment for that person. So that being said, how do they start to move in the right direction so they don't get overwhelmed trying to incorporate eight different versions of wealth into their life when yesterday they were already working 12 hours to build the thing to make them more money or, and they were barely finding time for date night with their spouse. Well, I'm smiling because chapter six says the best way to start is to start. <laughs> and I think often we go, how do I start? And your question's a very good one. No question. But often, how do I start is a trap because we're just seeing complexity. And what I'd say is the best way to start is to start. Lao Tzu said, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. I'm reading Nobu's memoir, Nobu, the Japanese sushi chef. And he said, I love it. He goes, one millimeter each day was my focus. So small daily, seemingly insignificant improvements when done consistently over time lead to stunning results. So just to answer your question head on, because it's a very good question. Out of, pick pick one thing. If it's your fitness, take the first step. And tomorrow, get in the gym again. And the day after that, get in the gym again. And when you stumble, don't beat yourself up. Remember that consistency is the mother of mastery, but there is no recovery without relapse. If you want to find love, make the first, send the first text, make the first ask. Go to the first date. How do you write a book? You write the first page today. And then tomorrow you write a second page. And after six months, you've got a book done or a year. How do you start a new business? You write the business plan. You call the first investor. You take the first step. It's it's like it's just step by step by step. I, and another thing I would simply say is be a minimalist versus a maximalist. Often we're in such fear that we don't stay with our project long enough for it to get traction. We we fall into shiny toy syndrome. There's one entrepreneur, I think of you know, every single time I meet him, he's got a new business he's starting. Every single time. It's like sh shiny toy of the week, right? And as entrepreneurs, we're all we're, like, I never I never found a great idea I never I didn't fall along with. 
But we've got to be monomaniacally focused on that one idea and then execute it, even if it takes 20 years until the world goes, wow, what a concept, which I, I wish I had thought about. So with these projects that the book is going to inspire us to achieve, don't pick 50. Pick one. Pick one 30-day challenge. Get that done. Keep a log. After 30 days, start another one. Be a minimalist versus a maximalist. I love that. And I think that when you when you can accomplish that one thing, you take that first step, then you start to realize that, okay, eventually you know where you're going with the eight different forms of wealth and you can eventually include into your life. But it's like the it's like giving yourself the agency to do that first thing and then it creates a proof point that it's possible. It's a, it creates a proof point that it's a, 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 it's an op it's an option to reshape your life even after you've been doing the same thing for so long. And I think that's probably a really powerful that's a really powerful idea and concept and 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 shake up that I think is really important for people. Yeah, maybe you know as as we're chatting about it what came to me is Mount Everest. So let's say the eight forms of wealth is the summit. It's the ideal. It's the, it's yeah. it's the peak. How do you get there? Base camp, then keep climbing step by step. Yeah. First, first camp, second camp, and you just continue. But you you want to know the direction to move, and you want, you want to know what the summit looks like. And the summit are the eight exactly. forms of wealth. Yeah, exactly. I love that. Um, where can people go to connect with you? If they want to learn more about the book, if they want to get the book, I'm assuming everywhere they usually get their books, but website, social, all that. Sure. Uh, they can get it. They can get the book at the wealthmoneycantbuy.com. And when they order it there, they can get some truly amazing bonuses. Okay. And um, they can also get it you know, in all good bookstores across the U.S. and Canada, worldwide, actually, Amazon, Audible, et cetera, et cetera. Perfect. Um, your socials, I mean, you're, you're everywhere. So what's your handle? I have to take a look and make sure I give you the right handle. One second. If I go to Instagram, um, and I'll put this in the show note as well. But I, I'm assuming you're at Robin Sharma almost everywhere. At Robin Sharma. At Robin yeah. Sharma on Instagram, uh, YouTube, yeah. Robin Sharma. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Two last rapid fire to close this out. Um, if you were if you were gonna look back after all the all I mean, you've written tons of books, you've had a great career, multiple seasons to your career as well. Um, which I always find a lot of fun when people can pivot and then kill it in other domains. Going from law to motivational speaker, coach, writer, that is like a complete one eighty. So good. <laughs> and you've done it exceptionally well. Um, if you're going to look back, what would you tell your 20 year old self? I would say it's amazing how far you get through sheer persistence and self belief. I would say get up at 5 a.m. and spend an hour every day making yourself into the strongest, most authentic, most clear, grounded, loving person you could possibly be. I would say. Don't listen to the critics. They know not of what they speak. I would say fitness is mission critical to playing your best game. And I would say have a great family life along the way. And lastly, I would say make sure you are serving because when you, to use Mahatma Gandhi's phrase, you know, when you lose yourself in service of others, you really find yourself. I love that. Okay. Robin, thank you so much. Thank you for writing this and thank you for putting, you know what, when you speak to other creators, when I speak to other creators, I get inspired because the love that you give your, your, your audience and your readers, I think that's a beautiful place to operate from. And I think that that's what a creator should aspire to be. So just, I want to say thank you. Thank you for coming on, but also thank you for putting as much into your work as you do. It means really a lot, Scott, and it's been a pleasure spending this hour with you. Thank you very much. And continued success.